Hi, Scottish Mud Larkin here. Uh, we're back at Monny Feath today. We're about to take a, a long trek up that way towards an area called Budden Ness. Um, but we can do that today. If you remember the last time that we were here, there was a red flag flying up over there um, to mark that the firing range was active. Today, the red flag's down and we have the go-ahead to get up there. So we better get marching along. Huge thanks to everyone who's subscribed to the channel. Thank you too to everybody who's left us lovely comments. It's, it's really great. It means a huge deal to us. And an extra special big thanks to everyone who's helped support us through Kofi. You're amazing. Thank you. Let's yeah. something. Okay, cool. We're not seeing a lot of glass today. Oh, that's really sweet. Yeah. Let me see. I'll get in there a wee bit. Oh, that's cool. Nice wee bit of blue. Yeah. Do you think that's a wee bit shiny or? Well, let's see. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, sorry, what do you think that might be? Hmm. It's quite difficult to see. It's not a, a really defined sharp edge, but there's definitely an angle in the piece. Yeah, it's so. an odd shape, that one. Yeah. Now, have a wee closer look at that. I'm going to pop around this side. Yeah, so if you can see there, there's a wee, a wee curve in that. It's definitely yeah. a curved piece of glass. Yeah. It's a wee bit. I'll take that. Yeah, that's yeah. nice. All right, yeah, that's that's right. that's quite nice actually. I mean, it's nice yeah. and frosted. Let's see what it looks like. Have a wee look at it. Yeah, that's quite nice and frosted. Hmm. What's it like on the other side? Oh, <laughs> it's like it's brand new. It looks like a bottleneck. It's probably broken quite recently, so that's but why that's, it's shiny. It's still nice on one side. <laughs> <laughs> Nice dark green colour. Uh -huh. For sea glass uh, that I would use in jewellery, but it probably isn't very suitable. But if you want to make a wind chime or if you just want to fill a jar with some pieces of sea glass, yeah. then it's perfect. This uh, large screw here is a, a bit of a giveaway for what might have been here. So if ever there's an indication that we have an industrial dump somewhere in this area, I think it's the, the amount of street signs that we find up here. So I think what we're looking at here is definitely some kind of uh, industrial dump. You can see some uh, old concrete up here. It's been buried and a lot more of it that's going to come pouring out with uh, erosion. So I hope you can hear us today, it's a very, very windy day again. Well, I don't know if you can see the sheets of rain over there in the distance, but thankfully the wind's blowing from the west, uh, and it seems to be getting a little bit brighter over in that direction, although very windy. What are you finding there? Well, as always, there's a little plastic in the tight line. Ah, cool! Thing. That's our second Smarties lid. Yeah. Let's have a wee peek. <laughs> awesome! Yeah. One day we might have a full alphabet. It's yeah. going to take a long time though. We'll keep collecting. Yeah. Uh, just a way up the end there, which sadly we can't get to because of the way that the tide's coming in. Um, this is Budden Ness up the top there, but we'll see a little bit about that later. There was actually a couple of uh, historic battles that are said to have taken place around that area. It's a little bit dubious, but we'll look into it a little bit later. We need to get up off this area of the shore. The tide's coming in very quickly. 
and yeah. I don't know if you can see it from here but yeah. if I stand up here you can see that the water's actually coming in around us on this beach the sun's come out and it's absolutely gorgeous but the water of course <laughs> has come in Nicole found that old interesting brown bottle yeah. over in the stones uh, that you can't see anymore because the, the water's coming and covered them up. Yeah. So what do you make of that then? Well, I can see that it's got a seam on the side here. Don't know yeah. if you can catch that there. It's got a seam, uh, which generally means it's made after the 1920s when bottle manufacturing was uh, automated. Now, if we look up, uh, the seam goes right through through the top, through the lip here. So that's after 1930. So this bottle is definitely made after 1930s. Before that, uh, the bottle lips were applied by hand and there's no seams on them. So Still potentially quite old though, isn't mm -hmm. it? I mean, I can see that it's quite thick. Uh, yeah. I can also see that the, the seam isn't as necessarily as neat as we find nowadays. It's quite a chunky seam, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it looks like it. I mean, what was it on the bottom there? Let's see. It's really difficult to see when it's wet. Yeah. Uh, okay, so there's a little number five under it. Mm. Um, I mean, I've got a book on uh, well, I've got, I've got a book on uh, identifying bottles, so we maybe have a look at that and see if we can we can date it, um, and we'll get the sand out of the bottle, and then we maybe get a better idea. Yeah, we'll give it a good clean up, and then uh, have a have uh -huh. a close look at it, or yeah. at least take some nice photos so that we can put them up on the uh -huh. on the tail end of the film. Yeah. Hey, it looks stunning! Yeah, <laughs> it's a nice whole bottle. Always nice to find a whole bottle. Yeah, it is. I mean, it's a bit dwarfed by the blue bottle you found the other week. But... Yeah, well, another beach, another bottle. Uh huh. Yeah, put some flowers in that. Here's the more driftwood there. Yeah, it's a really cool sign. Uh, it's uh, well, it's very colourful. Uh, don't know what it said. I think we'll probably leave it here. But you know, if you do, if you are looking for driftwood at any point, ooh, this is the. <laughs> It's also blowing up a bit of a sandstorm here around us. <laughs> yeah. It's a very windy so, yeah. day. If you are a driftwood collector, there's a lot of really cool driftwood pieces here. This bottle looks kind of old, like just the shape of it. Uh, but they've definitely recently broke. Oh. <laughs> I'm not wearing my wellies again. <laughs> uh, and this bottle bottom here says, dispose of properly. All right, nice. <laughs> It says there, Lighthouse Road and the East Ranges. Oh yeah. Well, it's not every day you see a road called Pistol North or Pistol South for that matter. Lighthouse, straight ahead. So here we are at Budden Ness. This is the easterly most part of the Tay River and just beyond the horizon there, or just beyond the hills that we can see here we enter into the sea between Denmark and Scotland One of the really remarkable things about this part of the foreshore of the Tay is that the sand here is so soft, it's so fluffy my feet sink really easily in through the sand and that's because the tides here are constantly moving the sandbanks around so much so in fact that one of those lighthouses that we saw earlier had to be moved 200 metres. A beacon of some kind has been located here at Budden Ness since at least 1687, when a coal-fired lighthouse stood here. That structure was replaced in 1820, though this newer version was later shortened and annexed as part of the new keeper's house. The remnants of the old lighthouse can clearly be seen in the rounded side of the keeper's house today. The buildings we see today, though, were constructed between 1865 and 1866. 
The pair was designed by Scotland's best known lighthouse designers, the Stevenson family, for a company called Trinity House in Dundee. As an aside, Thomas Stevenson was the father of one of Scotland's literary giants, Robert Louis Stevenson, author of the book Treasure Island. Back to the lighthouses. Bud and Ness High and Low were designed to line up a safe passage into the River Tay. The different heights of the towers meant that both lights were always visible to a vessel's pilot as they steered a course towards the city of Dundee. In only 20 years, these lighthouses were redundant. The constantly shifting sandbanks in the Tay meant that the lights no longer lined up to show a safe passage. Something had to be done. Meeting the problem with the kind of dramatic solution we should expect from Victorian engineers, the decision was made to lift and move Bud and Ness Low around 160 to 200 feet. Sources vary about how far the building was moved, but moved it was. Between May and June of 1885, Budden Low was lifted onto rails and moved to its current position. As time passed, tides also turned, and to briefly quote Robert Burns, the best laid schemes of mice and men are aft gang a By 1843, tidal movement had shifted the sandbanks again. Budden Nest Low and High were redundant once more. Sadly, this pair of amazing beacons went dark at this time. Budden Ness High was briefly used as an observation point, though in 1987 the lighthouse would be used to investigate the very thing that caused its lights to be extinguished 44 years before. The University of Dundee installed a radar scanner on the building to observe tidal movement affecting the positioning of sandbanks in the Tay. If you want to get along to see these amazing structures for yourself, just make sure you visit them when the red flag is down. <laughs> Nicole's just found a soldier. Can you explain why that would be a little ironic or at least humorous? Because yeah. this area has been a military range for over 150 years or something. Yeah, it's been 1897. <laughs> this area was bought over by the military for use as a training ground. Yeah. <laughs> That's quite funny. <laughs> cool. That's funny. Look when the well. light shines through them. Okay, I'll get round there. Oh. Oh, Come on, Sun, stay out. <laughs> That's a really lovely shell and it's almost the size of my palm. Beautiful, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, just had an excited noise from Nicole. Yeah. It's like a really old child of pottery. That's really nice. Look. Okay. That could be really old. Uh, I'm really more of a spongeware transferware person so I don't know how old this is. Yeah. Tell me if you know. Yeah that's a really nice pattern isn't it? Yeah yeah it's really kind of delicate. Very light. very light glaze. Mm -hmm. Almost bluish pottery. Mm -hmm. Yeah yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Very different from what we usually find. Yeah. It's gorgeous here, isn't it? Yeah, it's really nice. In the 16th century, there were reports that just north of where we are today, there was a battle between the Scots and the Vikings. After skeletal remains surfaced on Barry Links, not far from Budden Ness, the 16th century Scots chronicler Hector Boyce wrote his account of a great battle that had taken place in 1010. According to Boyce, the Danish king Sven Longbeard had been defeated in battle at Mortlach, around 100 miles from where we are today. Frustrated by his defeat, Sven set his eyes on attacking King Malcolm II of Scotland, and he entrusted a warrior named Camus to strike the attack. It was rumoured that Malcolm was amassing troops in Barry, so Camus was ordered to march south from Mortler and engage the king and his men. The Vikings and Scots clashed near Loch de Burn, which runs through what is now the town centre of Carnoustie. The violence and ferocity of the battle is said to have been such that it left the burn running red with the blood of Scots and Viking warriors. 
As the Scots began to gain an upper hand in battle, defeat appeared inevitable to Camus, so he fled, only to be followed and cut down by Robert de Keith at the Bray of Downey, a few miles west. Having defeated Camus and his men, the Scots then erected an elaborate two metre tall stone cross monument, the Camus Cross, to memorialise this Viking warrior. If the rest of the story seems plausible, perhaps the last part seems a little odd. Why would a Scots king go to the time and expense of commissioning a large memorial to his attacker? It begs the question, is Boyce's account reliable at all? Or is it his attempt to use the information he had at hand to fill in gaps in a dark age in Scots history? Boyce takes his lead from a 14th century scholar, John of Forden, who had interpreted carvings on the stone of Morlach to be a depiction of a Scots victory against the Vikings, though he makes no mention of any battle at Barry. The Stone of Morlach is now known to predate the battle that Fordham described. It is in fact a Pictish stone. Suffice to say for the moment, although little is known about the Picts, we do know that they dwelled in the east and north of what is now Scotland, and they were here until around 900 AD. As it happens, the Stone of Camus is also now known to be a Pictish stone. While that doesn't disprove the story of the Battle of Barry, it does refute any connection between the artefact and the warrior Boyce claims to be Camus. The name is, in fact, Celtic in origin. It was once strongly associated with the location of the Camus stone. In fact, Camus Town, which sounds a lot like Camus Stone when you think about it, is an old name for the place in which the stone stands today. If there never was a battle between Scots and Vikings here, then where did all the bones come from? By the mid-1800s, archaeologists had concluded that the bones had come from a Pictish cemetery and that they had been disinterred by the winds blasting Barry Lynx. Boyce had deduced that these bones must be the remains of a battle. John of Forden had fueled the idea that the Vikings were present and fighting in the east of Scotland in 1010, so why not here too? But these were no warrior's bones. The remains were both of men and women, and a sufficient number showed signs of arthritis in old age. Although many items, and some of them valuable, were found within the graves, no weapons of battle were ever found among them. With no weapons, an unlikely band of warriors, a name of local rather than Scandinavian origin, and a discredited 13th century account to rest his claims on, we have to ask, did the Battle of Barry actually take place? It is an odd question to ask when very many people accept that the battle did take place. The story has been told so many times that it has become apocryphal, a truth based on repetition rather than physical evidence. Whether or not it's true, it's a great story for the imagination to run wild in when wandering the fields of Budden Ness and Barry. Okay, that's us for today. And before we get off the beach, I just want to say a huge thank you again to everybody who's subscribed, everybody who's watching our videos, everybody who's commenting and liking our videos as well. It's fantastic. Thank you so much. An extra big special thanks to everybody who's helped support us through Kofi. You're all stars. Thank you. Yeah.